Uh, I think maybe we'll look at uh, Justin's deck, your Phoenix deck that we have here. Yeah, still a work in progress and still being kind of tweaked and messed around with. But um, and yeah, and also I sort of gave up, and I, as soon as the six six back <laughs> six we kind of came along, like, well, <laughs> that's it. No point in playing with, no point in trying to make this better anymore. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure that I'm sure there's people who've got Imperial Summons events and who'd uh, be interested to have a sort of deck list yeah, to work well, from. We can, yeah, we can go through it anyway and uh, and discuss it. So, okay. So, the the fundamental, like the, the basic strategy of the deck, or where the deck came from, was taking a look at what Phoenix were uh, actually initially really bad at. Um, this is. Um, yeah, what Phoenix are really, really bad at is uh, having good stats on their characters and being on the front foot at the start of the game. Phoenix are almost always on the back foot at the start of the game. Um, and so because of that, uh, you're really comp you, you can't compete with, um, with other aggressive decks. You just can't. Uh, so you are compelled to play a, either Dishonor, which I'm not a huge fan of personally, because as soon as you sniff out a fact, the fact that a deck is a, dis is a, is a, a dedicated Dishonor deck, uh, that makes their good. That makes their job much much harder because you all of a sudden start prioritizing and playing in a completely different way. Um, so the other value. So if you're not going dishonor, which is still a perfectly fine deck, but this this deck went in a different direction, which is the value direction. So, yay, yay, Phoenix value. <clears throat> so this deck has a real high win rate. Uh, but it also takes a really, really long time to win a game. So if you're playing it competitively, <laughs> you better get you better. I mean, you better have you know you better have you know mental fortitude, and you better learn to love tiebreakers because that's where a lot of these games are going, unfortunately, at the moment. Anyway, we'll go through it. The, the dynasty deck more or less picks itself. Um, so we'll start with the holdings: three imperial storehouse, three forgotten library, phoenix thrive on cards, and it's an angle that they can attack other decks from. You can you can dishonor other decks. Uh, you can dishonor the decks simply by bidding low and being able to match their higher bids with your Imperial Storehouses, Forgotten Libraries, Naive Students. So um, so those those six are really, really strong for me, uh, and they go in. Uh, after that, for the for the characters, the ones that do not make it in are easier to talk about. Uh, the Peacemaker doesn't make it in because despite being a 4-1, uh, for one, the Peacemaker cannot attack, and that is that's it's such a huge price to pay. For, for a character, not being able to initiate a challenge with a character defensively and, you know, his challenger ring or snagger ring is a really big, so he got cut. Uh, and the other one is the Serene Warrior, or Shiva Kasada, who, um, despite his, who, despite all his promise, uh, spends most games as a 0-0 zero -zero in a corner somewhere, feeling really, really <laughs> sad. Uh, Okay, so going through them, the Adept of the Waves is a 2-2 Shigenja for 2-2 Shigenja, which gives, uh, as an action, can give one of your guys um, uh, covert during a water challenge. Uh, so I could Diplomat honors one of Yeah, so he's, yeah, actually, is, is it even worth going through all these guys? We've been through them several times before. Um, I suppose it's worth pointing out. Okay, Shibitsukune, who is the best champ in the game. And I might get some uh, might get some stick for that, uh, but the pressure she exerts uh, on the game uh, if she comes out turn one is really quite unparalleled. And the game very very quickly stops being about the game and starts being about she uh, starts being about Sukune because she will completely take over a game if uh, if she's left unchallenged on the board. So uh, she is incredibly powerful. Um, the next most interesting, the Solemn Scholar, is she will do her best of today. <laughs> she will. She will do her best. Yes. And they, I mean, like it's the, the it's, it's they are the worst two rings. I mean, it's two rings, but they're the worst two rings. <laughs> she could do better. Yeah, they are. Well, that's yeah. that's she's like, devastating. I mean, like, yeah, like 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 the intro voiceover to any you know two dimensional side fighting game. She will do her best. Um, the solemn scholar is one of the secret heroes of the deck. Um, so. Uh, so he's the he's a one one uh, one. So it's the one one Shigenja with one glory for one. Um, and if you have the Earth Ring, he can bow someone. He can bow an attacking character, a character attacking you. Uh, he just he wins games. He is unbelievably mm -hmm. strong. And um, 
yeah, he's he is again, as I said, the secret hero of the deck. The Radiant Orator is another card worth taking a look at. Uh, again, she is appallingly statted. She is a 1-2 for 3, which is just terrible. Uh, but her ability is, because it's a printed ability, she gets around some of the most dangerous personalities in the game, like, mm. uh, honor, like uh, yeah, Honored Guest. She's one of the few things that can actually deal with Honored Guest. Um, if you get her honored, she becomes an offensive wrecking ball. She becomes so hard to deal with because all of a sudden she's a 3-4 or a 5-6 once you once you um, uh, power her up with the stronghold who is just going to send people home. Uh, so all of a sudden you're forced into into massively overcommitting against her. Um, so she's she can be eh, iffy, but she can also be absolutely... Die. She can dominate a board on, if, she's, her, if she's honored. Her, her being on the board at all from the other side makes assigning attackers really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, one of the one of the big tricks with Phoenix, uh, one of the things you need to get used to very early on is using your strongholds to increase your character's glory before any con yeah. conflicts, occurred, even if you don't have an honored personality. Uh, because, like, one of the big th again, one of the big things in Sukune is like for glory. If you bow your stronghold to to, to six, she can't be furied on an attack, uh, which makes her, you know, even more devastating. So anyway, um, the the dynasty side, apart from that, more or less picks itself. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I suppose the, there's one Atoma courtier in there, just because eh, the deck likes courtiers. It's a British again to deck with a bit of support from the Ojimbo and Shiba Sukune. The Ojimbo is basically there as a finisher. Um, one of the big finishing cards in the deck is Isawa Atsuko, um, who is a four-cost Shigenja 3-3, three, three, and during a Void Challenge, uh, her action in, is that she gives all uh, enemy characters, or opposing characters, minus one, minus one, and all of your characters, plus one, plus one. Uh, so if you have... So basically, if you're going to break a Stronghold, uh, Atsuko is the premier stronghold breaker in the game. She's astounding. And if you've got a Yojimbo to back her up, there's very little your opponent is going to be able to do about it. Very, very little. Uh, she can also, I mean, it's worth noting she can take her action from outside the battle, but again, with the Yojimbo, you can basically pile an awful lot of stuff onto one thing and be fairly sure that uh, it's going to stick. So those are kind of the, 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 kind of the main kind of standout characters um, in what? the... What yeah. do you mulligan for? Turn one, what do you mulligan for? Depends Depends on the clan. Uh, Tsukune turn one, because Tsukune, uh, turn one Tsukune, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. <laughs> Newsflash. Uh, obviously, except against Brad, where you just put Tsukune to the bottom and kind of, you know, weep quietly to yourself. Uh, but again, if Tsukune, if Tsukune is an answer, she takes over the game like no other personality does. So she's she's what you look for most of the time. Uh, again, it depends very much on the matchup. If you're facing Scorpion, then uh, I will generally look for Forgotten Library. Um, uh, against Crab, you want cheap people because you want to set up a wall before you buy anybody. Um, you just want to set up a wall of sacrificial way of the Crab targets before uh, before you buy anybody worthwhile. Um, uh, characters I tend to shove to the bottom. Uh, the Meddling Mediator goes to the bottom an awful lot. Mm -hmm. uh, way because she's much more powerful in the mid game you don't want to see early and she is tremendously powerful in the mid game uh, she can really mess people up and this is actually a theme of phoenix phoenix just make playing against them a real pain in the air so um so yeah anyway on to the conflict well so yeah, i can go how, how how do you tend to make your characters how much fate would you normally stick on them like with the dragon deck i tend to make one or two guys and then put as much fate as i possibly can so they're around the entire game but i've seen yeah. like the line maybe one maybe zero and just churn out guys where does phoenix stick okay so for me um okay so the mulligan the two cards you're looking for in mulligan at the start of the game certainly that i'm looking for in mulligan are display of power and assassination so how I tend to play this game is if I hit the assassination, then I will buy one. Um, so I'll buy one big character uh, with uh, a lot of fate on them, um, and then I will pass. So one of the main, well, again, one of the main strategies as we get into further into this is passing as often as you can first in the dynasty phase because mm -hmm. you want to take that fate from people and very slowly grind them down. Yeah. I mean, one of the things the Phoenix are all also very denying or denying and removing fate on opposing characters and just basically grinding their board down 
uh, like as a form, it's basically just economic warfare over a number of turns. So if you can pass first and get the fate, um, then you are not. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a two fate swing. Being able to pass first is a two fate swing, and you should be looking to 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 engineer that as much as you possibly can. Sometimes it's not possible, but wherever, even if it leaves you slightly behind um, on the board, often it's worth taking that fate. Uh, just to deny your opponent the extra resources. Okay, so uh, three against the waves. It is the yeah, it's probably the straight action in the game uh, because it also has the added utility of being able to bow opposing Jigenja. It makes yeah, Tagashi Yakuni tremendously sad. I can see a, an awfully a, a heavy sigh from Baz. Um, against the waves is incredible. It's just hugely, hugely powerful. Um, assassination. Uh, as Phoenix, I think you actually need to play three because you will always, always be behind at the start of the game. Well, not always, but most of the time at the start of the game. And if you can make your one big guy, uh, you know, pass first, and then you've got one big guy to defend against an attack, or you might have a Mirror Modus Fury to defend against an attack, you can assassinate their other small guy, and you've established board control, fate control... Um, and from that point, it should be very, very hard for your opponent to to break your position down because you're set up for the game at that point. Um, so assassination is very, very important. It's arguably the most important card to see in your mulligan. Uh, so you so ju just to confirm, a clan champion and assassination first turn. Oh, oh, how yeah. far we've come in this environment. Yeah, absolutely. How, how things have changed. How things have changed. Um Okay, so next is Banzai. You're playing three Banzai because it is the best card in the game. It does the most for the least of any card in the game. So you're playing three. You're playing three court games because court games is probably just a notch under Banzai in terms of its utility power. Um, okay, uh, and obviously court games allows you to honor your characters. And one of the other major things you want to be doing is Phoenix. The most important thing, in fact, you're going to be doing as Phoenix is honoring your characters. Mm -hmm. If you get it, like, the, the, the reason you want to do this is that an honored character begets other honored characters. Once you've got one honored character, you can dominate the fire ring. Um, uh, because you can, you can basically push through a guaranteed challenge and honor another character and honor another character. And all of a sudden, your board is completely uncontrollable. It's just too big, and you've got too much flexibility with your stronghold and where you're putting a plus two, plus two bonus. Um, yeah, it, it just gets crazy. So, court games is a big deal in, in achieving that, in honoring your guys. It's very rare that I'll dishonor uh, an opposing character. Uh, display of power is display of power. Uh, if it goes off, it probably wins a game or comes close to it. If uh, it gets countered, it probably loses a game or close to it. So, yeah, so you, I mean, against, uh, against, uh, against Crane, against Scorpion, and against clans, you think are splashing. Predominantly Scorpion, Crane much less so. Uh, you really need to pick your spots with display. Um, and some, the thing is, sometimes you need to save up a bit of fate so that you can actually bait out um, uh, a Voice of Honor or a Forge Edict with display. That's just the way it goes. But uh, yeah, it's, the display has complete blowout potential. So it's, um, yeah, it's super, super powerful. And it's now blocking out the rest of the card list. So For I shame! <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah, I know. For shame. Okay, for shame. Uh, the premier courtier uh, uh, event in the game. Uh, so it either so yeah, it targets an opponent, a, a, an opposing character. They can either dishonor uh, the character or they can bow it. Both choices are terrible against Phoenix because once your character is dishonored, then I'm bowing my stronghold to make your character even smaller, um, or you're bowing them, which means they're they may as well not be in the the fight at all. So. Um, so yeah, just super efficient, super powerful. Is that and, uh, is that a reason quality. for uh, playing the Otomo as your like yes, extra? Yes, it is. Yeah. Just just to up the courtier count. The Otomo courtier is actually just terrible and will be going out very very quickly. But uh, but it's the best choice of what's left in it's, my opinion. It's, it's your K day slot. Oh no, there there are, there are several other K day slots like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just just play one K day. That's that's enough. Yeah. Oh. I <laughs> okay, so next, let go. Uh, two let go because uh, three mirror mode is fury. So obviously, let go is Phoenix are super susceptible to attachments. Um, they have a really bad time against attachments. So 
uh, you want to let go because Phoenix are based around janky abilities and situational play. Anything that interrupts that can actually be really detrimental to your chances of winning. So let go becomes very, 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 very important. Like nothing, nothing says it's sad like having um, uh, Shiba Tsukune with Cloud the Mind on her just sitting there <laughs> being being effectively useless. So, um, so yeah, let go super important. Likewise, Mirror Mode is Fury because you want to because you want the game to go long because Phoenix probably have the best inevitability of any clan in the game. Um, you want, yeah, you, you want to you want to get past the early turns and just get yourself set up and established. And Mirror Mode is Fury keeps your provinces alive. Actually, we should look at the provinces as well in a second. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so next is Supernatural Storm. That's a card that could come in, go out. It's been in out on a bunch a, a bunch of times. Um, Only a one and off. Super it's a one of. It's a finisher again. If you're looking to break a uh, stronghold, then you go in with uh, like with. You know, you, you you splash all your fate on a big wide board, which has got four or five Shigenja. You go in with your Yojimbo. Uh, you know, you supernatural one of your Shigenja, make them big. Your Atsuko makes everything on your side bigger, everything on their side smaller. And then the Yojimbo just says, no, you can't do anything about it. So it's, it's a finisher. Um, this card will be absolutely unbelievable as soon as Phoenix can field uh, a deck of Shiba Tsukune, uh, Shibio Jimbo and Shigenja. But right now it's just not quite there, but it'll be absolutely incredible very, very soon. Very, very soon. Um, so. <clears throat> Way of the Phoenix? After that, we've got two. Way of the Phoenix. Okay, so this card has gone in a deck. It's been a whole bunch of things like Spies at Court. Um, but Way of the Phoenix is a really asymmetric effect. Um, it's a borderline NPE because you're just telling your opponent, no, you don't get to do this at all. Uh, and it can have a huge impact on the game. Uh, it functions as a, as an economy card because you can shut someone out of like a ring with two fate on it. So you get two fate, which is backbreaking. Um, it allows you like with, with, with Sukune, if you know, you can just say, no, you're not getting the firing this turn. In fact, no one's getting the firing this turn. And then Sukune resolves it at the end of the turn. Comes enormous, and at the start of the next turn, Sukune runs across, wins a conflict, claims the fire ring, and honors another one of your characters, and you're feeling super happy about that. <laughs> so, Way of the Phoenix, it's it's a situational card um, with the capacity to become really, really noxious uh, later on. Like once we start to see like ring lockout combos, uh, which are coming again with with cards like K Day, uh, it could be yeah, it could be pretty pretty rough. So, uh, I think that's all the events anyway, and after that we're into the attachments. Um, so, three Cloud the Mind, because Cloud the Mind is amazing, um, and because Phoenix, again, are fragile and situational, you need answers to big threats that come out against you, because you have to buy time to get yourself set up and just basically um, put yourself in a position where you're dominating the board. So Cloud the Mind allows you to do that. Uh, flying Katana is Flying Katana. It's not a great card by any stretch, um, but it's just the best of what's there at the moment. Uh, magnificent. Okay, and likewise Ornate Fan. It's not great, but it's the best of what's there at the moment. Magnificent Kimono is a hugely under underrated card. Um, it's one of the main ways you get to honor your, your, your characters. Um, it's an attachment that also helps you win political conflicts. Uh, and again, honoring characters for Phoenix is really the lifeblood of what they do. That's, that's what makes Phoenix very... I mean, that, that's, that's how Phoenix really win games, is by honoring... Or at least this, that's how this deck wins, at least militarily anyway, by honoring characters. So it's very, very important in that regard. Um... The deck did run Spies in Court, uh, which is kind of a slight combo with this because uh, traits go off before, um, or keywords, I'm not sure what they're called in this game, is it traits or keywords? Anyway, because they go off before reactions to winning, so um, like if you had a <clears throat> if you had an honoured uh, character that was going in, or sorry, if you had a character that was uh, going into a challenge, like you win a political challenge with, um, with Magnificent Kimono, you honour first, and then you could play Spies at Court. Uh, which basically removes the honor, but you get the spies of court effect. So, um, which is fine. Like if you have an already honored character and you go in, then kimono goes off first. You honor, and then spies of court would remove the honor. So it's yeah, not not perfect, but uh, but still it, it gives you a bit of leeway. Um, 
almost never used on opposing characters, I found, even playing Dishonored. The risk is just too high that they somehow pull something out, win the conflict, and all of a sudden you've got an odd monster running around on the other side of the table. But it's super, super important, I think, for, for Feeney. And then Pacifism, which is, again, kind of an eh uh, card, but there's just not a lot else that's, that's really, really good. Um, it has been very, very important in certain games. It gives you an answer against certain really big, unpleasant champions like Quesada and uh, Taturi. Uh, and can also be used for sneakily pushing through unopposed military uh, conflicts later in the game. So, yeah, so the deck really just looks to grind the game out. Um, one thing about Phoenix I found as well is that if Phoenix get ahead, you are in a world of trouble because no no clan is harder to come back on than Phoenix. Um, like, there, there, is a re- there is a reason Phoenix start behind in most games because once they get ahead, they're incredibly hard to, to reverse tempo on. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the most crushing games I've had, uh, the most crushing games of actually of, I've, of five rings that I've seen have involved Phoenix just getting a really good start and literally steamrolling an opponent with nothing they could do. So, yeah, and that's it. That almost never happens, though. Most of the time you're in it for a long, long grind. And uh, quick that's word on uh, provinces? Oh, provinces, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're playing Secret of Void. Uh, so you are obviously playing Shameful Display and Kurei Mori. You're playing Shameful Display because it's the best province in the game. Uh, you're playing Kurei Mori because it's very, very good. Um, once Phoenix lose Secret of Void, then it is Kurei Mori that will be going away and Shameful Display that will be staying. Um, because, again, honoring and dishonoring is powerful for Phoenix and in Phoenix. Yeah, um, yeah Shameful is just... A, I can't, certainly while this stronghold is around, I, I just can't see Phoenix not playing this ever. So Kure Mori, also very good. Again, another Void Province, you get a fate whenever it flips up. And that's one of the things about the, the provinces, because entrenched position, position uh, goes under your stronghold. So three of your four provinces will give you fate when flipped. That's Manicured, Kure Mori, and Chainful Display, which helps set you up for Miramoda's Fury and or Display of Power. Um... So that's all was, that's worth bearing in mind. And the other one is Meditations on the Tau, which basically, again, is just uh, another way of waging economic warfare on your opponent by removing fate from their characters. So that is it. It is a grinder deck. Um, and uh, as I said, I mean, the win rate for this deck is very, very high. Very, very high. Uh, but it just takes a long time to win games. So as for its viability in a tournament setting, I'm not so sure. But there you go. And we, we still don't know what the tiebreakers are going to be. That is that is yep. still due to be announced any second. Presumably yeah. as, as soon as this video goes out. <laughs> <laughs> as is traditional. All right. Thanks for that, Justin. Um, and no so, problem. 